the thought of trading a quote unquote steady paycheck in exchange for freelance income. You know, I kind of have this idea of freelance income as being, you know, fluctuating from month to month and being really inconsistent and unreliable and things like that. And um, I have just found in my almost four years of being a freelancer that that's not been the case at all. Welcome to the Teacher Money Show, the podcast dedicated to helping teachers navigate your unique financial challenges and unlock your financial superpowers. I'm your host, Sean Morgan, a full-time teacher. That's right, I teach every day just like you and personal financial coach. And I'm here to help every teacher, whether you're a seasoned teacher looking for fresh insights or a new educator navigating your first paycheck, have a richer wallet, classroom, and life. The contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice. And neither I nor my guests are engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should not act upon this information without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. I'm super excited to have Hillary on our show today because if we're talking about having a richer wallet, she can help you get there. Hillary is a former adjunct instructor and writing teacher. Today, she is the CEO and founder of Moneta Copy. That's M-O-N-E-T-A, in case you want to know how it's spelled, a marketing and content agency for financial services professionals. She's also the co-founder of Teachers Make the Leap, a community of teachers building online freelance businesses to change the way work shows up in their lives. Hillary, welcome so much to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I'm excited to have this conversation. I, I can't wait to talk to you. Hillary is a good friend of mine. Uh, we've got to hang out at uh, FinCon. I know I've mentioned that a few times on, on the show, but it's just it's where I made tons of great connections and uh, found out that Hillary is a former teacher. So I just had to have her on to talk about uh, what she does. And I mean, she's got her community teachers take the leap. So, you know, it's, it's a, uh, sorry, teachers make the leap. And, it, you know, I, we have that overlap there. I just want to talk about it. So can you tell us a bit about your background in education? You mentioned in your, your bio that uh, you're a former adjunct instructional writing teacher. Just how'd you get into teaching? What'd you do, et cetera? Yeah. So I, when I was in college, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, like a lot of people. And I ended up landing on an English degree because that was just kind of my favorite subject in school. So I was like, well, this makes sense. Let's just major in English. Um, so I really enjoyed all of my classes. I loved like you know, um, kind of getting to read all the time for my degree and things like that. But as I was in my final semester of my senior year, I started having these fears of like, I'm going to need to start getting paid soon. Like who, who hires English majors? I'm not really sure about that. Um, so what I ended up doing was I decided to just like keep that snowball rolling. And so I started looking into master's degree programs for, for English and, and what kind of things that they offered. And I stumbled upon the teaching English as a second language master's program. So that's really where my teaching, um, background started. And to be clear, I, I had always kind of felt like teaching was maybe going to be my path. I, I come from a really long line of teachers. My mom was a teacher. My grandparents were both teachers. My great grandparent or my great grandfather was a teacher. So teaching, it, it always kind of felt like it was in my blood. Um, but for whatever reason, I didn't want to be an education major. So I ended up getting my master's degree um, as a teaching English as a second language. And part of the, uh, a process of that was also applying for a graduate teaching assistantship, which is how I paid for my master's degree. Um, and if your listeners aren't familiar with what that is, it means that they they pay my tuition, they pay for my health insurance, and I get a small stipend in exchange for teaching um, a section or two of like the English 101 style class for freshmen. So as a graduate student, so it sounds like teaching assistantship, like I would have a professor in the classroom that I was kind of assisting, but I was the only person in the classroom, you know, it was my class, I followed the curriculum. And so that's how I really got started as a teacher. Um, and I really fell in love with it. Like I loved working with college students. I loved teaching writing. And um, as I was finishing up my master's degree, it was a two year program. So I, I ended up getting four semesters of teaching experience that way. I started applying for jobs overseas, thinking I was going to go teach English um, in China. I was applying for jobs in Thailand and Qatar and just kind of all over the world. 
And I was really excited about that. And then two months before I graduated, I met my now husband and realized I don't really want to leave, you know, the country quite yet. This budding relationship is happening and I don't feel like I can let it go. So I ended up applying for a permanent position at the university that I had just graduated from. Um, And so I got a full-time position teaching the same classes that I had been teaching during my master's, but as like a professional instructor. So I taught there for a year and then we decided to move to Colorado. And so I continued looking for similar jobs like that. And I ended up landing a job at Colorado State University and I taught there for, uh, now I'm forgetting, two years, one year. I have about five years total experience teaching writing at the college level. So yeah, that's kind of my teaching background. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you were a teacher, not, not the same as uh, a lot of teachers that probably listen to this podcast, you know, you're in the university level. So that is slightly different. You know, there's less poking of one student into the other, but um, it's still, you know, still being a teacher and now you're doing something else, obviously. So what, what did that transition look like into having an online business? Yeah. So my transition, You know, I would say my transition actually really began in 2018 when I was starting to look for those teaching jobs in Colorado. And I interviewed for a couple different positions at community colleges, again, because I don't have the education bachelor's degree. Um, I'm not a licensed teacher. So my only options were really to teach at community colleges or state universities, you know, any teaching jobs that just required a master's degree. Um, And so I was interviewing for a couple of jobs and the pay that was being offered with these jobs was just completely unlivable in the state of Colorado. It was just going to be, you know, not, not doable. And they were jobs that were going to offer me maybe one section a semester or two sections a semester. And so I was going to have to cobble together, you know, teaching jobs from multiple different institutions to make it work until I, until I found the position at Colorado state and got hired for that. So That's kind of where I started to experience, I guess, some disillusionment with the fields that I had chosen. And just like this doesn't feel like a sustainable career path from an income perspective. And I I knew the workload that was going to be required and um, things just were starting to not add up for me. So then I got the job at CSU and I I really did love it. The pay was better than what I had been offered at community colleges. Um, The job security was still pretty low. It was a job where, you know, they couldn't guarantee sections from semester to semester. So every semester there was this period of anxiety and waiting, you know, am I going to get enough sections to pay my bills next semester? And that just kind of kept happening every three to four months. And so it was a succession of a few semesters like that of feeling like, I don't know if I'm going to have the income I need. I'm not able to save a cushion for myself based on the income that I'm making with how high the cost of living is Colorado in Colorado. And I really just need to figure something else out. And so kind of the pinnacle, I guess, of those two things or the, all those things coming together was in 2020, of course, when the pandemic hit and they came back to us in March and April and said, you really shouldn't count on a job, you know, next fall. We have no idea what's going to happen in the meantime, please reorganize your entire way of teaching and like, you know, do all this extra work to keep things going, you know, March through May. Um, and it was at that point that I was like, I have to figure something else out. And so I, I had this moment and this is a a story that I tell often on our podcast. Um, but I had this moment where I was talking to my dad on the phone who is a successful entrepreneur himself. And I was kind of just complaining to him a little bit, you know, I was like very much in this victim stance of like, you know, I worked really hard for this master's degree. These jobs require master's degrees, but they don't pay enough. Like, I just feel like I'm kind of a victim of this system and it's really unfair. And, you know, I'm a teacher. I'm not qualified to do anything else. I don't know what I'm going to do if I don't get this job, all these things. It was a total complaint fest. Um, And my dad, his response was, 
well, Hillary, there's a lot of ways to make money in this world. And at the time I kind of rolled my eyes and was like, maybe for people like you, dad, but not for people like me. Um, but that statement really kind of stuck with me. And so when I discovered this old, this whole other world of freelancing and that freelancing could be sustainable and I could get paid to, to write um, for, for businesses and things like that, that idea really took hold of me. And so I spent that entire summer kind of building that business. So sorry, that was a really long winded answer to your question, but. No worries. I, I appreciate yeah. it. I mean, like there's that moment, there's always the moment that, that changes our, our life. And and you remember that moment because it's important. So I, I, you know, and it's always something silly. <laughs> like it's, mm -hmm. it's never something yeah. like earth shattering, you know, um, you know, what got me into personal finance was a window salesman. Okay. Like it's, it doesn't have to be something uh, absolutely earth shattering. It can just be something silly that changes your entire perspective. And speaking of perspective for a lot of teachers, you know, starting an online business can seem really daunting. Uh, what motivated, you know, you to actually do it and what can motivate teachers to, to take that leap into entrepreneurship and, and what are some challenges they might face in that uh, initial stage? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so for me, having someone else who was a few steps ahead of me and knowing that there was someone else kind of doing what I was doing was a really important part of my journey because it gave me some confidence that I otherwise wouldn't have had that I could make this work. And so that person for me is um, my podcast co-host who you know, and she's also the co-founder of Teachers Make the Leap. Her name is Kristen. And she discovered this copywriting course and mentorship group online. It, you know, it was a paid course and mentorship group um, that she signed up for. And she just kind of took a leap of faith and bet on herself and was like, I'm going to try out this copywriting thing. And so when she started talking to me about that, I thought like, I would really love to do something like that too. I did initially have this thought of, oh, well, Kristen's already doing it. So there's no room for me. And then once I like, you know, thought about it a little bit more, I realized that was a silly way of thinking. Um, and so I ended up kind of taking the leap, joining that same mentorship group and things like that. So that's kind of what Kristen and I are trying to do with Teachers Make the Leap is we're trying to be that person for a lot of other teachers to just show what's possible and that you, you can bet on yourself, so to speak, and um, really kind of discover this whole world of what it's like to work for yourself instead of only kind of relying on your teaching degree or your teaching background as a way to make money. Uh, and I, I think that's really important. You said only, right? So uh, I, I don't think that you have to leave teaching to do this. If you are absolutely burnt out on teaching, don't want to do it anymore. And you, are, you know, having a terrible experience and your students are suffering as a result, then, you know, this could be something you could do to transition out of teaching, but it's also a great way to supplement your income. Uh, being a business owner doesn't, it's not an all or nothing thing, especially since, you know, for teachers, we have that summer, uh, that time off to, you know, really ramp up the business during the summer. I think that's huge. And, you know, when you are doing that, you need some help. And I, I love how you're, you're, there to help teachers, you know, get started. Um, and, and the teacher's trying to get started, right? You know, let's say they, they are listening to you now. They, they have that person that's ahead of them. What's the first step after they're done that? Should they make a bunch of business cards? Should they get yeah. an LLC? What, like, what, what's the actual first step that a teacher needs to, to take to start an online business of some kind? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I'm going to answer it in just a second, because there's one thing that you said that just really resonates with me. And I just kind of want to share my experience with it is that you don't have to leave teaching to start an online business. And in fact, I did not leave teaching for two and a half semesters. While when I, after I started my business, um, I started my business in June of 2020. I got my first client by the end of July. And then I got another client, um, I think at the end of August, maybe, or, or, early September. And I wasn't really going that hard after getting lots and lots of clients right away because I wasn't sure I was ready to leave teaching. There were a lot of things that I was frustrated about with the pay and, you know, the, the work-life balance for lack of a better word, but I loved teaching. I loved working with students. I still miss working with students. And so I did find a way to like really kind of side hustle my business. And it wasn't until I was making like 
kind of stupid amounts of money compared to a, a, what I was making as a teacher that I was finally like, you know what, it doesn't actually make sense for me to keep teaching because I'm making so much more money here. I should be putting all of my energy here. You know, we were just trying to start a family and all of these things were kind of coming together in my personal life that it made a lot of sense to, to prioritize my business and myself. But there was a long time there where I was thinking, I really want to do both because I really love both. Um, so I just love that you kind of brought that up. It's not something that you have to quit teaching and do. Um, now to answer your question, what the first step is, I think the first step is to really figure out what business lights you up. Like what is something that you can do as a side hustle or as a full-time business, if that's your goal, that's not going to feel like another ho-hum career path. That's not something that's going to burn you out down the road. Um, and I think there are so many options out there. So for me, of course, I went in the copywriting route because I really love writing and I know I'm really good at writing. So it made sense to just take something that I already enjoyed and figure out a way to get paid for it. Another teacher who's in our community, she's starting a graphic design business because she really loved designing all of her um, classroom decorations. Like she made all of those in Canva. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Canva, the platform. I know a lot of teachers are. Um, and so she also started designing like birthday invitations for her friend's kids and like just doing all these things. And so that was another thing that she figured out I could freelance my design skills and really build a business here doing this kind of stuff. So I think there's lots of different options. Some of them, like I know I've heard you talk about, you could power wash driveways and probably make really good money doing that in the summer. Like that's such a great option. And then I think there, there are other things, like if you have a passion and you don't have to figure out how to monetize every passion you have. But if you have a passion and you think you would enjoy getting paid for that passion, there's probably a way to turn it into a freelance business. Yeah, I think that that's a really important that, you know, it doesn't have to just be copywriting, right? If you're an English teacher, that's a natural choice. It's relatively mm -hmm. easy. Um, but I mean, you know, if you're artsy, graphic design and, you know, as a hack, if you're going to do a freelance graphic design, teachers get a free pro version of Canva. So I mean, right. Like, bam, right there. That's like hacking, being a teacher and doing your graphic design at the same time, because Canva is not going to be like, you're actually using this for, you know, your freelance business. That's a no, no, right? They, they just give it to you because you are a teacher. So that's, you know, th there's lots of opportunities like that. And, uh, you know, whatever your skill is as a teacher, I guarantee that can be parlayed into a side business. So like, if you like, yeah. you know, you chose your, your, field in, in teaching for a reason, right? You probably like it. Right? You like writing, you like reading, right? So that's why you went that way. So don't be like, oh, I'm a teacher of, you know, uh, math, but I guess I need to be a freelance writer now because Hillary said so, right? If you don't like writing, don't do that, right? Choose whatever your, you know, passion is. If you really like math, freelance, like accounting. Yeah, like, bookkeeping. Goodness, right, bookkeeping, huge, huge deal. So, I mean, like there's just lots of, of opportunity, no matter what your passion or your, um, you know, skill set is in the freelance space. And those things can usually be ramped up really well during the summer when you have time. And none of these things require another degree. You know, what I do now is marketing. I don't have a marketing degree and I don't need a marketing degree. Not a single one of my clients. And I've worked with dozens and dozens of clients over the past few years. Not a single one has ever asked me if I even have any sort of degree. Um, so I think that's another kind of misconception that I know that I had early in my business. Like, well, if I want to do something different and am, am I going to go need to get like a different degree for it? And when you work for yourself and you're trying to find clients who will pay you for your services, the way that you, I guess, quote unquote, sell yourself as a business owner is just totally different than how you try to sell yourself on a resume or in a job interview. And you have to show like, well, I have these qualifications and things like that. Um, so that was also really freeing for me, I think, when I was thinking about what other options do I have to make money besides being a teacher? Yeah, I, I, I is actually, you know, before I got the job I have, I was burnt out on teaching. I was looking for jobs outside of teaching and I was getting a whole bunch of silence because my mm. experience was all teaching, right? But I've done freelance work. I, I had a one freelance client, who one freelance writing client, not anymore, but I had one and they didn't ask, right? There, mm -hmm. there, there was just no reason. It's like, can you write on this topic? Yes or no? 
done, right? That's all that they need. Um, because they're not like married to you. Like, you know, like when you get a job, like there's a lot of like commitment there. But when you have a freelance thing, if they don't like what you do, they just don't hire you again, right? Right. But if you do a good job, which I know that you will because you're a teacher and teachers are rock stars, right? Then they'll hire you again and they'll tell their friends and you know, you'll be able to to get it going no matter what you're doing for for other people. The more you do, the better you do it, you'll be able to of course get more clientele and do well regardless of your quote unquote qualifications. Now you said you need to find what you know lights you up, your passion. I don't know about you, but I got the squirrel syndrome, right? Just mm. so many things. Like, how do you choose what to focus on? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I'm so glad you asked it because I think that is one obstacle that keeps people from doing really well as a business owner or a freelancer is they try to do too many things at once. Um, I think there's this misconception and it makes sense. Like if I can do all these things, people are going to want to hire me because I can do all the things, but you're actually a lot more attractive if you really clearly market yourself or, or I don't, I don't like to use that word exactly. Um, but you are more attractive if you can showcase that you are really specialized in one area and that you can do one thing really, really, really well, um, because people love to hire and work with an expert. So this is kind of an age old example, but it, you know, it's like, if you have a heart problem, you're not going to go see a foot doctor, you're going to go see a cardiologist. And it's really the same thing as a freelancer. And so it is a really important thing to not have shiny object syndrome and to like really commit to one idea. But I think a lot of teachers who are thinking about starting a business do have a little bit of that squirrel syndrome of like, well, I really like this and I really like this and I really like this. I could probably do all of them. And so Kristen and I actually just led a workshop on how to nail down like what the perfect idea for you is. And we take this three pronged approach to it. Um, so I'm going to give like a really shortened version of kind of how we help people figure out what they should focus on for their business idea. Um, the number one thing is to figure out what is your priority. So if your priority is to just make an extra thousand dollars a month, that gives you a little bit of freedom. It's actually not that hard to make a thousand dollars a month with a freelance business. Um, and so you kind of have a lot to choose from. If your priority is to leave teaching as fast as you can and like make this your last year in the classroom and you really need to replace your entire teaching income, um, then you know you want to choose something that is going to be profitable and that there is a market for out there. So you have to think about what are your priorities first and then pair that with like I said, what are your passions? So maybe you have these four kind of passions that, you know, you could freelance. How are those kind of aligning with your priorities? And then the third one is profitability. So you have to look at your maybe three or four different ideas and you have to do a little bit of research and see what are other freelancers charging for these kind of skills and what kind of clients are they getting? And do the clients that I would want to work with maybe have the budget to pay somebody like me? So it takes a little bit of guesswork and a little bit of trust, but you do at least have a framework to make sure that all three of those things um, are kind of aligning. And that should hopefully help you land on one business idea. Awesome. Thank you for, for that. Uh, I, I love, I love like alliterations or, or um, you know, like, I'm forgetting the word when you have like a word and then each word means something. Yes. <laughs> what is that word? You're an English teacher. Um, maybe an anagram. Maybe. This is just this an acronym. Acronym. An there acronym. we go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking anagram too. I'm like, that doesn't seem right. Yeah. yeah. Like th those, kind of, those kind of mnemonic devices are just really helpful to really, you know, zone in on something and, and remember it. Um, so I think that's helpful just because, you know, it, you need something to, to keep your brain focused when you're trying mm -hmm. to um, decide what to do. And please just choose one thing. Right. And also yeah. make sure it's profitable. Um, you know, that, that that's huge. So, like, I'm not sure about where everyone else lives, but in my town, we have this thing called uh, Raising Cane's Chicken. Mm. Which, if you never heard of Raising Cane's Chicken. They have one thing on their menu. And that's chicken fingers. If you don't want chicken fingers, don't go to Raising Cane's Chicken. There, there's nothing else that you can get except for the menu with like their fries and their their toast. But like it, it's just a package. Wow. That's all you get there, right? And it's wildly successful. It blows my mind, but it's wildly successful because they have one thing. And if you want chicken fingers, 
that's where you go in town. Like that's the only place that anyone goes, right? The same thing for like, you know, um, uh, in and out, right? They've got like a very, you know, streamlined menu, right? Their brand, they, they know what it is and they stick with it, right? And that's what you need to do. You need to have a brand of like, I'm an expert at this thing, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I've never gone to any of these other places like, you know, like Wendy's or McDonald's or whatever and been like, they have the best chicken fingers. And like, mm -hmm. I would get chicken fingers there for my kid because I want to eat <laughs> and my kid will eat nothing but chicken fingers. But if you want chicken fingers, the best place in town is Raising Cane's. And that's because they built that brand around that. So just you, we want to think we need to do so much, but choosing one thing, sticking with it is really, really important, especially because your brain can only offer so much attention to so many different things. So the more focus you give on that, the more successful you will be. Yeah. And that's exactly why, um, you know, I, I didn't even just stop at calling myself a copywriter. You know, I've seen some people say, well, I can do web design and copywriting. They go really well together for me. I, only do copywriting. And not only that, I only do copywriting for financial advisors and financial coaches. And so when a financial advisor or a financial coach is looking to hire a copywriter, I'm the more attractive choice than someone who's like, I do copywriting for any small business, you know, because I have, I'm showing that I have that expertise in, in financial advisor stuff and financial coaching, um, marketing and things like that. So like you really, that all that to say, you really can't get too specific when you're deciding on a business idea the more specific you are, the more attractive you are to a specific type of client. Amen to that. Amen to that. Okay. So uh, let's say you want to do this, right? You want to have an online business or, or any business really, because these principles really apply anywhere, but you also want to be a teacher because that's your passion. That's what you, you know, were born to do. Cause let's be honest, if you're going to be a good teacher, you were pretty much born to do it. I mean, I hate to put people in that label, but like, teaching's hard yeah. and you are either you got the stuff or you're not going to be here very long. So if you are the one of those that are, you've got the stuff and you want to keep doing it, but you also want to make some extra income. How can you go about balancing those? We've said it's possible. We've given some ideas here, but like, what, what would you recommend the teachers do to balance being a uh, business owner and being a teacher? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that I would say is don't underestimate the power of 30 minutes. If you can commit 30 minutes to your business, especially when you're first starting to get it off the ground a day, you can actually make a lot happen in one, two, and three months if you just keep consistent. So I always say, you know, spending 30 minutes a day kind of being consistent and moving the needle forward in really small steps um, is much more effective than spending eight hours every Saturday working on your business. Because I think at that point, you're going to burn yourself out. Whereas from my perspective, it's easier to say, I'm only going to do this for 30 minutes and then I'm going to go on with my day. Um, another thing, and I know I've heard you talk about this before, Sean, is you have to get a little bit selfish. Um, so you have to start saying no to working outside of your contracted hours. You have to start saying no to going above and beyond for your district when they ask you um, to do unpaid work. You have to start saying no to tutoring students in your off hours for, for no pay, you know, whatever it is that like you continue to do outside of your contract hours you have to find a way to let that go. And I know you have a lot of good kind of tips and strategies for that. That's one thing that I had to do was I had to get really ruthless with my time um, when I when I wanted to start building my business. The other thing that I will say, and this is not an option for everyone, but I know it is an option for some teachers. And so I just wanted to throw it out there. And this is what I was able to do is the first semester that I was building my business, um, I was teaching full time and I was working with two clients um, and I essentially doubled my teaching income working with just two clients. So um, you don't need to take on like a ton of extra work if you build your business with profitability in mind to make really good extra money. Um, but if you do decide that you want to spend a little bit more time on your business and you have the option to ask your school if you can go down to part-time hours, you know, I've heard of, of schools doing really kind of interesting things with part-time. My mom, for example, um, used to teach first grade full-time and she and another teacher at her school, they both wanted to go part-time at the same time. So they were able to work out a deal with their elementary school where she taught one week and then her fellow teacher taught 
next week. And then she taught one week and then her fellow teacher taught the next week. So I think it's always something worth asking your principal or whoever your administration, whoever it is, kind of what the options are, because you never really know when you ask. And that's what I ended up doing. Obviously, as an adjunct instructor, I had a little bit more flexibility. You know, I was able to go from four sections one semester to three sections the next semester to two sections in what ended up being my final semester teaching. And that was a really nice way to ramp down my teaching contract hours while ramping up my time in my business kind of gradually. Yeah, I, I love what you said about being ruthless about your your personal time, though. I mean, like if you're showing up probably, you know, 30 minutes to an hour early, uh, even before your contract time. I, I know teachers who get to school really early or staying, mm -hmm. you know, an hour or two or three or more after your contract hours. I mean, I, my English teacher in high school admitted to being at the school at 11 o'clock at night and reciting Shakespeare into the courtyard through the window because she was a little nuts. But the point is that she was there. Right? She wasn't at mm -hmm. home being home. Right. Uh, so teachers like you can take more of your time back and what you use that time with can either be, you know, building a business or, catching up on stranger things or whatever it is you're watching on Netflix, or whatever, like you, we have time. You just need to be, you know, very intentional about how you use that time. And if you feel like you don't have time or you would be taking away time from your family or whatever, consider waking up earlier, right? 30 mm -hmm. minutes for most people earlier in the morning is not going to kill you. <laughs> and it's, mm -hmm. you, you. You're already tired. Okay. And trust me, I've talked to and met many teachers you've got coffee injected into your veins every morning anyway. So 30 <laughs> extra minutes is going to build your business and you'll be fine. So, I mean, th those are just some ideas of things you can do to really uh, take that, that time back. One other thing I'll throw in here before we move on. Um, I actually ended up reading a book really early in my business journey for this very reason. I knew that a major time suck of mine that I was having trouble kind of dealing with was scrolling on social media. Um, and I knew that I was probably spending like an hour or more a day on social media. And if I could remove that from my life, and that was like an easy hour to get back and to work you know, like on my business, I found this really great book. It's called How to Break Up With Your Phone by Catherine Price. And it really actually helped me. It's kind of this 30 day journey to just like developing a healthier relationship with your phone. And, you know, she has a lot of great tips and strategies for how to reduce temptation to open up apps on your phone that, you know, are going to end up sucking away precious time from you. So um, that was just another plug I wanted to give because it was really helpful for me when I was like if, trying to figure this out. Awesome. And if you would like you know, to find that book, I will put it in the show notes. You can find all the show notes to this show at teachermoneyshow.com slash podcast. And you'll be able to find the show notes for, for any, any show, any episode uh, on that page. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to wrap it down here. Um, and I just want to make sure we hit the most important points. So uh, are there any, uh, misconceptions or fears or, or problems that teachers have um, when they're starting their business that they need to overcome that you could give them some tips on? Yeah, I know that a big one for me was the thought of trading a quote unquote steady paycheck in exchange for freelance income. You know, I kind of had this idea of freelance income as being you know, fluctuating from month to month and being really inconsistent and unreliable and things like that. And um, I have just found in my almost four years of being a freelancer that that's not been the case at all. Of course, there are fluctuations from month to month. What I found, though, is that at a certain point, I really reached a baseline level that my fluctuations never really dipped below. And so for me, when my baseline level became my teaching salary, um, I just had so much more enjoyment in my life, I guess, because the fluctuations were like, well, some months I'll have more money and some months I'll be back down to my teaching salary and some months I'll have more money. And that's much better in my opinion than just having a really low paycheck every single month. That's never going to change. Um, I also know from my perspective, I know this isn't true for all teachers, but from my perspective in my teaching field, um, job security was a little bit lower. And so 
freelancing, it actually feels a lot more secure to me because when I have five clients that I'm working with, if one leaves me, I still have income coming in from four clients. And that gives me a lot of buffer time to find another one or two clients to fill the place of the one who left. So I think the the biggest misconception is that freelancing is like unstable. And I have just not found that to be true. I actually find more stability in it um, than I did as a teacher because I have more control over who I work with and and who I get paid by. Right. And, you know, as long as you're good, which once again, you're a good teacher. So you're going to be good at whatever you put your mind to and whatever you you know do that hard work to get. Uh, if you're good. You will keep your clients. And I, I think that that's an important thing to remember that business does not have to be uh, terrifying. Right. You, right. you can do it. Okay. Wrapping it up now, my last two questions that I ask all of my guests, what is your number one tip for teachers to have a richer wallet classroom and life? Um, I think my number one tip for teachers is to listen to that inner voice. So whatever that inner voice is telling you um, is, a, is a good indication of what your next path might be, whether that's to stay in teaching and figure out a way to live more comfortably in your teaching income, or whether it's to, um, you know, add in an additional source of income without totally like increasing your workload and trying to figure that out. So I guess I'm rambling a little bit here, but yeah, my, my number one tip is to just listen to those inner nudges that are telling you what's working in your life right now, what's not working in your life right now. And if you listen to those and you follow those, in my experience, the money follows that too. Awesome. Your inner voice. We got a regular Socrates here listening to their inner uh, thing. <laughs> I, I'm, in, I'm reading Greek stuff right now. Okay. Um, and how can teachers get in contact with you? Yeah, so they can find um, me and Kristen at Teachers Make the Leap on Instagram. That's where we show up most often on social social media. We're also on LinkedIn, um, Teachers Make the Leap, but we don't post on there quite as often. They can also check out our podcast, which again is Teachers Make the Leap. We're on all the podcast platforms um, or our website, which is TeachersMakeTheLeap.com. We try to keep it consistent across, across the board. Seems like uh, at Teachers Make the Leap anywhere. That's what you need to know. So pretty, pretty yeah. straightforward. Uh, and thank you so much, Heather, for coming on the show. It was, it was a lot of fun talking to you today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Sean. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to come on the podcast for coaching, to share an expert opinion, or just to talk about a topic you think is relevant, I'd love to talk to you. Just fill out the form at teachermoneyshow.com slash guest. I look forward to talking with you.